Hello and welcome to the wonderful world of Innova, alive and composing with today's guest, Hans Tamman. Would you please state your name for the record? Hans Tamman. And we ask this of every composer on the label, do you have a pet at home? If so, what kind? A pet. We have two cats, we have a frog, and we have a turtle. Are they named interesting and creative things that would allow us an insight into your creative potential? I left it to my kids to name them. The, name them. the turtle is called Herman, the frog is called uh, Mr. Jack Sparrow, and the cats are Tuna and uh, Fritzi. That already tells me that you're willing to seed <laughs> creative decisions within the family, which may relate to something called the Third Eye Orchestra. Would you say that's true or not? Yeah, of course. I like to... Uh, if I can trust people, I can uh, just let them do what they want. And if you can't trust your family, who can you trust with such major decisions? In my orchestra, almost everybody. I just, uh, when I write pieces, I always write them with the uh, players in mind. The idea of like creating a piece for a bassoon and then having some random person playing, it doesn't make uh, sense to me because I hear so many individual interesting things uh, in, in my performance um, that I really like to just see some of the decisions uh, to them and let them improvise within a certain context. Great. Uh, cast your mind back, would you, to your earliest sound memory. Do you have one? What is it? Bad question. Okay. <laughs> I have no I have no earliest sound memory in that case I can remember that I was watching certain TV shows and was singing the songs uh, to myself creating a little uh, hit uh, parade at the evening until my mother came through the door and said you know you have to sleep but it's not really sound it was all it was not sound it was all like melody and songs which I'm not that interested into uh, in these days and where did this take place? Uh, somewhere in Germany, for instance? That was in Germany, I think. I don't even know in which city, because my parents moved like every two or three years, but I was probably like six, seven, eight years old, and I do not really remember where we lived at the time. And at what point did you t take up an instrument, like a guitar or something else, that told you music might be in your future? I think I had very big interest and interest uh, in, in instruments before I was always listening to Deep Purple and then playing the same piece over and over again imagining myself being the singer and the organist and the guitarist and the bass guitarist and I, I did so with lots of things and my grandfather at some point uh, when I was 15 came through the door and said look uh, here's an old guitar I have in my basement do you want to play it my guess is if he would have brought a saxophone, I would be a saxophonist today or something uh, like that. But and then my parents were like really upset because they always tried to uh, prevent him from doing that because he, they wanted me to learn in school and all these kind of things. Yeah, at the end they were right. I uh, failed my high school degree uh, and uh, it was mainly because I was like interested in like political uh, groups and playing guitar, so that was it. Is there something about the nature of political groups that you just mentioned that plays into how you organized your your universe, your musical uh, group here? Not really. I'm, I'm, I'm of course like very, very um, affected by what's going on politically here, like currently I'm just like, as a German, this whole thing with gun control, or better, like with, with the gun madness in the United States is like uh, really... Uh, very affecting me, but I never was able to bring this into like a political piece. Every time I tried to make my pieces political or so, it was like uh, not working out and more like uh, embarrassing. So I tried to keep these kind of uh, worlds like separate. I can think of composers like Cornelius Cardio or Fred Jewski who have had political aspects to their music. Sometimes it's about politics rather than of the politics. Do, do you maintain that separation too? Uh, probably, yes. I mean, Roshevsky, I think that works. You know, Kaikadu, I see this like uh, as very interesting uh, options to, to, to 
combine these worlds, but I was never able to, to do that. And what were your first steps uh, after the grandfather had provided you with the guitar and you'd been playing around for a while? Was there like a turning point, a, a life-changing instant when you heard something, you looked at something, you read a poem, or you saw a picture that said, I'm going to go for it no matter what? I, I think this happened to my entire, like now, 40-year-old uh, career all the time. I, I remember first I, I started playing rock music like you know, Richie Blackmore and like Deep Purple, they were my heroes. And then um, I listened to some jazz pieces that were like bringing me like harmonies that I've never thought of before. And there was interesting seeing a performance by Philippe Caterine, uh, at that time, very crazy guitarist. Then I ended up like uh, listening to Sonny Chirac, who changed my life completely because I started banging frantically on my guitar and he, he showed me basically that you can bring all the power of like John Coltrane, the energy into, into the guitar playing which like other jazz guitar players didn't influence me that much you know I have this crazy saxophone playing and guitar players were playing this bling plong stuff all the time so Sonny Chirac was a real life changer and then uh, towards the end of the 80s I figured that you know with all the jazz playing that I did um, it was more interesting I, I got much bigger ears in the intros in these extended intros when we were playing and you know, when everybody was like uh, reacting to each other and you had these amazing soundscapes and then somebody played the head and all the energy went right out of the window so that's why I usually say uh, today I'm only playing the intros uh, because that was um, what really changed my my thinking and today looking back I say from then I'm, I'm only interested in sound and rhythm and harmony and melody is not that interesting for me anymore not that important What's the role of virtuosity in your work? Uh, is there something technical? Is it something dazzling? Or is it something kind of deeper and psychological, that, like the ability to reveal yourself and listen and respond in a kind of organic group? I think the latter. I mean, the, the um, uh, basic, um, you know, from the classical tradition coming, um, the idea of virtuosity of like fast, um, the rather silly compositions of like, uh, Paganini and, and so on, this doesn't um, really, uh, you know, interest me that much. I find it often, whether it's in jazz or in heavy metal or in uh, other things, that virtuosity is often rather than a hindrance in, like, revealing your uh, true uh, self. Um, but then there's also this, like, discussion, for example, Keith Rowe insists that, you know, he's not a virtual... Uh, he's not a virtuoso because he doesn't do these kind of playing that I dismissed like a minute ago but I've seen him like sustaining a drone for 45 minutes and that's virtuosity you know this like what you call maybe inner self I mean like you know keeping your attention with this like one idea for like 45 minutes this is amazing he's a virtuoso you know and this is the virtuosity that I also expect from my musicians in my third eye orchestra you know you, you get a solo you know it might be a development over you know six seven eight minutes over background that I that I set up now keep it going keep, you know and you know, the people I choose for my my ensemble are usually capable of doing it in that sense they're all virtuals what kind of strategies have you used for controlling improvisation? I, I, I think of like available forms. L. Brown's work with structures and things. And how does that play into your ability to kind of decompose what would happen naturally if you were out of the room, or to send it in different directions? I started originally with like we had this great improvising tent in Germany, the Ensemble Two Inc. And what we did is we for like. Twice a year we met in a barn for a week and we were improvising together, discussing why did you do this decision, that decision. We recorded our stuff, we were listening to this and every time something came up that we felt was a problem, for example, every time the drummer makes a big hit, everybody stops because this is a great ending. So we played with these things, we used little compositional ideas to learn to do, uh, you know, 
go in other directions. Another example is like everybody in improvisation is so attuned to listening to everybody what they're doing. When you have great improvisers, that's always an issue. You know, you have to also learn to not uh, listen to somebody and just develop an idea with like the, with somebody here uh, versus the people there. Or you, you always are attuned to listening to your neighbors, not to the people over there. So on all, all these kind of things we were experimenting with and we played for 10 years and that was like one way of organizing improvisation that worked very well. I have not seen an ensemble that big that is able to play that transparently than that. The um, Third Eye Orchestra is not a matter of like organizing improvisation. It is uh, a matter of like, for me, I want to write certain music i want to have people play it but i need also to to understand that there's like these people that i choose give so much of their own uh, ideas into the the music that i need to give them some space and for myself i'm an improviser i like to improvise also in other areas of my life so that's why i'm using the old brown idea to um do some kind of a real-time live arrangement. So everything is written, but I'm going on stage. I improvise by putting the, these different elements together and create a background from where individuals are improvising. So it's it, it's both, you know. It's I want to create my own music, but I also want to uh, give people an opportunity to improvise. And I myself, I have to improvise as well. To what degree are you the author of this? composition. If someone else from the band were to step up front and instruct the same musicians, how differently would it come out? I'm pretty sure it would come out totally different, differently. I think it's often a matter of timing. You know, I have, I have very clear ideas how long the elements have to go and I rarely find these ideas uh, executed by other uh, people. I'm very influenced by minimal music, which with these long developments you have like very simple ideas, but by juxtaposing several of them together you create this amazing complex complexity. And I like it sometimes to go for 10 minutes and I would not find probably other people doing it uh, that long. Except if you get like a dedicated minimalist composer probably. And then some other things I need to change fast. It's the idea of like contraction and expansion and so on. That's very, very, very connected to myself. Besides the fact that all the other the notes, except the individual playings, are all like written out. And why the third eye orchestra? Something spiritual? Uh, I had to come up with a, as usual with my projects, there's an opportunity I have to come up with an idea, with a name quickly. I have to admit that there's a, this huge list of ideas and names on my computer so that I do not have to look for this for, for days and days. And I had a performance in Russia with this, one of the earlier versions of this and they needed a name now. And the third eye, of course, is like the, the, the uh, intuition. So I find it like fitting. So since then it's the third eye orchestra. And you have other outlets for your music. I, I know you work at a place called Harvest Works and does electronics and uh, set pieces form a, a part of your compositional life too? No, I don't mean Harvest Works is of course a great uh, inspiration for my electronics, uh, but otherwise um, these are two different things. And what's coming up next? The Third Eye Orchestra has a performance in uh, on March 8, on May 18th um, on the Queen's New Music Festival in Long Island City. That's great. Where I'm writing a new piece for. Uh, I have also been a recipient of a generous Map Fund grant to create the same kind of idea of like for like 15 players of electronic instruments. It pushes the idea of the laptop orchestra further because usually pieces for laptops or so uh, are, you know, like as you write for a symphony orchestra, you're not having like the individual player really in mind. But I think especially if you look into this tradition of like, you know, experimental electronic uh, instruments or like all these people are instrument builders. 
So it makes no sense to just let's say let them play some laptop. You have to look what are these individuals, what is their idiosyncratic, what's their very individual uh, expression. And so I'm writing actually a piece for 15 soloists here, you know, and uh, it's like the, the breadth of the instruments is like, you know, breathtaking. It's amazing what you find these days in, in like unique ideas. So I'm working on it. The um, grand is due August uh, 2014. Somehow this year or beginning of next year, we have a premiere. Well, good luck herding all of those electronic cats. And we love your music and keep up the good work. Great. Thanks a lot. <laughs>